It is time to get going, so if y'all will bow with me, we'll begin with prayer. Our great Father in heaven, we are thankful again for another day on this earth. Uh, we know those days are numbered. We know that you know the number of those days for us. And God, we ask that we will be useful to your kingdom in those days that we have left. Uh, Lord, help us to use these times together to prepare ourselves for, uh, for obeying uh, better, for bringing you more glory, for telling others about you, for uh, being those who would stand up for truth in the midst of a world that is uh, I've, uh, honestly just sometimes unconcerned with truth. Uh, God, we want to be uh, great examples of your character, examples of your standard, and help us, Lord, as we continue to grow and develop, that we will grow and develop in a way that uh, is helpful to others and, most of all, Lord, uh, honoring to you. Uh, help us as we jump into the study of the book of Jeremiah, that we would learn from uh, his sorrow, that we would learn from his uh, willingness and uh, determination to follow you and do things your way. Help us to be like him in the way that we teach and in the way that we represent you. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, we are digging into the book of Jeremiah. If you want to open your Bibles there, the book of Jeremiah. Uh, we are starting our new quarter, so we're going to try to go through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and then I'm going to be out of town for a couple of weeks, and so Scott has agreed to get up and teach Ezra and Nehemiah so that I can come back in town and teach the book of Daniel. I know that's a little out of order, but I really want to teach the book of Daniel and Scott was like, "Fine, just pull rank on me." And I'm like, "Okay." okay. And uh, so, uh, so we're going to do that a little bit out of order because I really want to teach the book of uh, Daniel, uh, but we'll be, you know, going through Daniel and Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and hitting those last three of the minor prophets uh, before we get to the end of the quarter. So, quite a lot to cover, uh, especially with a book like Jeremiah and trying to squeeze that into four classes, but we'll be jumping in today to do that. We're going to try to cover chapters 1 through 20 today, uh, just to kind of get a, 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 you know, kind of a basic overview of the things that we're going to go through there. So, Jeremiah, hopefully everybody is there. Before we get too much into the text, let's uh, just go ahead and kind of introduce the book. Jeremiah supposedly means Yahweh establishes. Now, the reason I say supposedly is because uh, the, they're not exactly sure how the first part of his name should be understood as a verb uh, because it's kind of a, an odd word to go with the concept of God. Uh, so that's kind of the best guess we have as to what his name might have been uh, purpose to mean. Uh, he prophesies through the reigns of Josiah, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. And so we're kind of dividing the book up based on those reigns as good as we can. It doesn't necessarily always say, these are the words Jeremiah spoke while Je no, Josiah sat on the throne. You just kind of have to do your, your best guess there. Uh, we know he was born a, a priest or in a priestly family in Anathoth, which is just north of Jerusalem. Uh, he had a lot of interaction with Jerusalem in his lifetime, and particularly in his early life, we know that he had some interactions even with Josiah as king. So he came from what seemed to be a very prominent family, a prominent priestly family, uh, and was involved with a lot of the, probably the reforms during the time of Josiah. He was chosen to be a prophet before he was born, uh, you kind of have that stated in a bit of a poetic way there in chapter 1 and verse 5. Somebody read that for us. Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Okay. So there, you know, we that kind of got similar language there to some of the things you read in the Psalms. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that while he was a zygote in the womb, that, uh, that God went, that's the one to do the job. Could be, 
Uh, you know, I'm not discounting that. God very much knows who we are from before we're born. Uh, at the point here in a bit of a public language is from the earliest moments, uh, I, was, I was chosen to do this job. God determined me from my family and my position where I was that this was the job for me and he was going to call me to do it. So he's called to the prophetic office while he's still very young or he becomes aware of the fact that he's going to be a prophet. Somebody read six. Okay, so they're immediately jumping from womb to uh, responding to God uh, as a young man. Uh, he knows that he has chosen to do this job and, and uh, he's, going to be do he's going to do it. Verse 9 and 10 basically talked about the commission God gives him. Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and told me, I have now filled your mouth with my words. See, I have appointed you today over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and demolish, to build and plant. Uh, and so there again, uh, God is, is, is setting him apart for a very particular job. So the job he's been chosen to do, pleasant or unpleasant? Unpleasant. Extremely unpleasant. And I'm going to be honest, uh, if I were a, an Israelite or a, a Jew back in these days and I got the call to be a, a, a prophet, I probably would have gone home and cried a little bit because it never was, was pleasant to be a prophet of God in, in this time period. Uh, and so here, now again, maybe there's a different response with Jeremiah because here he is called during the reign of Josiah. And during the reign of Josiah, were things good or bad? Good. I mean, Josiah, uh, about 17 years in, makes major reform. He, you know, really changes things around. He pulls the people back to God, reestablishes the feast. I mean, he does a lot of good. And so maybe Jeremiah's like, okay, maybe this will be good. But God makes it very clear in the commission that it's not going to be so pleasant. And, and so we're going to see that. Mr. Sink? Well, and, and you are, you are, um, well, yeah, yeah, we all are. I mean, we all are. And, and how easy is it to stand for God in a world that doesn't really stand for God? Yeah, it, it, and, and especially the more outspoken you are, the more difficult it gets. And the more you deliver the message, the more difficult it can be, uh, which we've talked about a lot in some of our uh, discussions on evangelism. So there, I mean, as you get into the story of Jeremiah, go ahead and prep yourself for this isn't going to be pleasant. I mean, just that know that. Uh, what do we nickname Jeremiah? I heard several answers. What? Weeping prophet? What'd you say? Okay, yeah. I mean, it. He he's known for his lamenting, which is where the term lamentations comes from it's the lamenting so he's known for not just delivering bad news which all the prophets delivered bad news because all the prophets in this time are delivering the news of the day of the lord that's coming and destruction and judgment and captivity and exile and all of the bad stuff now they also deliver good news okay the 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 coming kingdom the messiah the good things that are going to come after uh, exile. And so we, they have both sides, but Jeremiah is uniquely positioned because he doesn't just talk about what's to come, he lives it. And that's the big, you know, with Isaiah, uh, as much as I'm my favorite, second favorite book of prophecy, Daniel being first, which is why I couldn't let Scott teach it. So, you know, it, when, when you get the, uh, uh, you know, Isaiah was, <laughs> my Bible went missing. Uh, Isaiah is, uh, you know, delivers a lot of bad news, but also with Isaiah, he doesn't necessarily live through it. Whereas Jeremiah gets to talk about what's going to happen, gets to watch it happen and prophesy during it, then gets carried away into his own captivity, separated from his people, 
There's all sorts of bad things that Jeremiah ends up experiencing as a part of being a prophet of God. Uh, Ezekiel too, but Ezekiel's more of during captivity. We'll get to him when we're done with, with Jeremiah. So he began his ministry, this is kind of small, I apologize about that. He began his ministry during the reign of King Josiah. He was even a mourner at King Josiah's funeral. Uh, just to kind of give you the idea of the connections that exist here between the people. He is forbidden to marry because of the terrible time in which he lives. So that's kind of a, a difficult thing to deal with. Uh, he never made a convert that we're aware of. Uh, not that he was converting people. He never convinced anybody necessarily that they needed to turn their life around. And God told him he wasn't going to. He was rejected by his people. He was hated by his people. He was beaten by the officials. He was put in stocks at one point. He's in prison, and he gets charged with being a traitor, which is kind of hard to stomach when you're the only one actually not being a traitor and a people who are supposed to follow a God they have deserted, right? But he's the one charged with being a traitor. Uh, his message broke his own heart, uh, which is difficult. Scott? Yeah. Yeah. So betrayed. Add, add betrayal by those who are closest to you to the list. I mean, it, anybody want to trade lives with this fella? I mean, it, it's awful what he ended up going through. Uh, now, again, he's not alone in that. Were there other prophets who suffered greatly in their service for God as examples to the people? <coughs> yes, there are. And so, uh, you know, again, like I said, that's part of the difficult thing to deal with here when you're, when you're called to be a prophet. Dallas? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, he wanted to resign at one point. God wouldn't let him, uh, which is, again, difficult. Uh, he saw the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity. He was permitted to remain in the land by the captain of the Babylonian forces. But when the remnant wanted to flee from there to Egypt, he told him not to go, but he ended up being forced to go with them, and he ended up dying there, not even in his homeland. And some say, we don't know, this is why, you know, we know some of the prophets were killed as a result of their prophecy. Tradition says Jeremiah was, but we don't really know that. That's not really told to us by any text. Uh, and, and so... Again, not, not a pleasant life, not a pleasant series of events in the, a long life of prophesying, which is what you have here with Jeremiah. That's the, part of the other part of this is that we only have glimpses into the lives of some of the prophets. We have a long life of prophecy with, with Jeremiah. We know about his prophecies over a long stretch of time, all the way from Josiah to Zedekiah, uh, where it's like with Jonah, we know about a few days, however long it took to run, be swallowed, be spit up, go do your prophecy, and then be disappointed that they weren't destroyed. You know, we maybe have a month or two uh, of his life, whereas Jeremiah, we have a long stretch of, of prophecies and sermons and things that he experienced. We, we see him constantly be belittled and rejected and beaten and, and persecuted because of the job he does for God. God.
Yeah. It's rare that you don't have both sides. Uh, Tiffany and I were talking about Jeremiah on the way here. Jeremiah is one of the most negative prophets, uh, of, of especially of the major prophets. You know, uh, Isaiah spent well close to half of his book talking about the messianic kingdom, the good things to come, and the restoration, and, and the peace that came with that Messiah, and Emmanuel, and, and, uh, and the, the, the stem that was going to come out of the stump, and you know, all of these different things. You have a lot of positive images in the book of, of Isaiah. With, with Jeremiah, maybe three or four sections. Most of them are just a few verses long. And then you've got that central section, uh, chapter 30 through 33, which talk about the coming kingdom. But of 50-something chapters, three of them deal with the good things that are going to come, but not until all the bad stuff is gone. But the good thing that, that's going to come, you know, uh, I, there is definitely an emphasis and a, a stress of the negative. Uh, fix things. Recognize your sin. Uh, confess your sin. Repent of your sin. Make sure you deal with your sin. Come to God with your sin. Then there'll be restoration. There's always the hope. Uh, there's always the, the planting and the, uh, as, as, Scott pointed out the build and plant, but it always comes after the destroy, the demolish, the uprooting, and the tearing down. Uh, and so that, that is, I, I think, a good observation there. You do see that pattern. Um, I won't go that direction. All right, so uh, there are some odd discrepancies when you deal with the book of Jeremiah. If you dig into a extensive study of it, where there are a lot of differences between what's called the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Okay, the Septuagint, Masoretic text and the Septuagint were kind of two traditions of the old law, and they most commonly are pretty well in agreement. Masoretic text and the, you know, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures that was created uh, in the like 1 to 200 B.C.s. It's what Jesus taught out of very often. Uh, but you've got the Masoretic text, which was the official Hebrew text of Scripture that was copied year after year, and, and, and that's what they kind of carried on through as their text. What we have in our Bibles is based off of the Masoretic text. And one of the reasons for that is the Septuagint is missing portions of the Masoretic text. They are missing, missing portions of Jeremiah. So it's about an eighth shorter. Things are ordered differently in the, in the Septuagint than they are the Masoretic text. And what most people think happened is that when Jeremiah was carted down to Egypt, he had his writings with him, but you also have Baruch, who we're not going to talk about today, we'll talk about more on Wednesday, was asked to compile together all of the things that Jeremiah had taught. They think that Baruch's writing uh, was the basis for one of the texts, and Jeremiah's collection was the basis of the other, and that's why you have a, they were separated when they had to do the compiling, and maybe that explains the difference. All of that really doesn't make a big difference for us because... We have the longer version, which includes everything the shorter version has, plus a little bit extra. Okay? Uh, and it's all recognized to be the writings and, and preaching and teaching of Jeremiah. So it's not an issue of, well, well, is some of this fabricated? Would some of this not supposed to be there? That's not really an issue in this discussion. You will have people who try to make it an issue. It's not an issue. Everything we have is very faithfully understood to be the writings and the teachings of Jeremiah. It's just a matter of, of uh, you know, some of the, some of the missing portions uh, we do with all that. Uh, but our, our Bible is based on the longer Masoretic text, which gives us the most complete picture, which makes us not have to worry about whether we're missing something or not. Does that make sense? Okay, so <coughs> I just say that. 
And I know some of you like to dig a little deeper and, you know, just to put that out there so that you're able to see what's going on. All right, so here's the outline we're going to work off of as we go through the book of Jeremiah. And again, these are estimations as to which prophecies he gave when. Sometimes they are identified. Most of the time they are not. You base it off of what we know was going on in the nation at the time and the things that were talked about. If somehow some of chapters 1 through 20 really wasn't under the reign of Josiah and Jehoiakim, maybe it was in Zedekiah, it really doesn't make a difference. Uh, this is just the basis uh, outline, basic outline that we're going to go off of using, uh, going through the text. So we're going to talk about the prophecies of Josiah, uh, or that happened under Josiah and Jehoiakim first today, and then we're going to talk about the prophecies that came after that on Wednesday, and then we'll talk about the end of the book, which is the fall of Jerusalem and the observations of that uh, when we get to uh, next Sunday as we try to wrap up a lot of what we're talking about. And then we will take a fourth class and go back and really examine chapters 30 through 33 because that's what the schedule says I'm supposed to do. So that's what I will do. <clears throat> uh, so prophecies under Josiah and Jehoiakim. Uh, you've got in chapter 1, and we talked about some of the details already, the prophet's call and commission from God. He's called from birth or, or from the womb. Uh, he is chosen by God for a special purpose to do this job. Are there other examples of people being chosen by God from, from birth or from the womb? Can you think of any? John the Baptist, okay. Uh, we know his birth was prophesied, right? An angel came down and said this was going to happen. And he was chosen for a purpose. Anyone else? Samson, very good. Angel comes down and tells his parents that they're going to have a child and he needed to be a Nazarite and that he was going to be uh, a judge for God's purposes. Anybody else? Jesus, obviously, well before his birth. Do what? Samuel, very good. Uh, that, you know, here his mom prayed for him. So again, I, I, I say that because this is not a bizarre thing. I would dare even say God has more of a hand in choosing us and determining our path, uh, even uh, all through Scripture and even maybe into today, than we probably give God credit for. One of the great emphases when you get through the book of Genesis is how often God controlled the birth and, and the, the pregnancy process. It is odd that when you go through the story of Genesis, Sarah was barren until God opened her womb. Rebecca says God opened her womb. Rachel was barren until God opened her womb. Leah was not barren, but was caused to be barren and then blessed with children. I mean, so over and over and over again, you've got God controlling exactly who was to be born, when they were to be born. God was, had a very hands-on approach with all of that. Uh, I don't know why we assume that that ever ends. Okay? Uh, you know, we, we tend to think we have control over that because we got medicines and all that other kind of stuff. Do we? Uh, and, and so I, 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 I just say, that, that's not an odd, an odd concept. Uh, so he's called from birth. He's going to be chosen for this special purpose, to be a prophet to the people. God tells him, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you. So God promises from the very beginning two things. One is he would be with Jeremiah. That's comforting. The other part, though, don't be afraid of them implies what? Yeah, there's going to be something to be afraid of. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's, uh, I've always wondered with my own kids not, not to tell them preemptively, well, don't be afraid, you know, because I'm already putting the idea of being afraid into their head as if what they're about to do should be something they should be afraid of, right? I mean, that, that is, uh, you, you see that right here from the beginning with the, with the call of Jeremiah. And so, now, that being said, it's also comforting because when he is afraid, what does he have to fall back on? Yeah, when, when you know, God has told me from the very beginning, don't be afraid, 
I am, I'm there. I, I'm, I'm with you to deliver you. I'll take care of you through this. Uh, and so when you do have those moments of fear, you've got a God to fall back on. And, and that is, that's comforting. Then he has these two vision. Uh, I struggle a little bit having never experienced a divine vision myself how to really understand what it was like to have a divine vision. Because, uh, I mean, as far as we know, he's shown a, a picture, or, or maybe it'd be like watching a YouTube video in your head. Or you know, I also have an issue where I don't picture things. Uh, I've, I've never been diagnosed, but I suspect that I have a thing called aphantasia where I don't think and picture. I have no mind's eye. Like, I just don't picture anything at all. And so the idea of having visions is such a bizarre concept to me from an experiential level. Y'all, Most of y'all probably don't have that issue, and you see pictures in your head all the time. You know, God says, what do you see? I see a branch of an almond tree. Like, <laughs> you know, okay, here's what that means. Uh, and, and then same thing, of, what do you see? I see a boiling pot facing from the north, you know, it, that, okay, here's what that means. And got these different images or videos or whatever is going on in his head, and God takes those images and turns them into something. Okay? God takes it. You know, I would even go so far as to say God places those images there so that there can be a conversation about what these images mean so that he can have something to fall back on uh, in these in these um, interpretations. So you got here at the beginning this almond branch. What does it mean? The almond rod? <coughs> this is verse 12 of chapter 1. What does it mean? Okay. For I watch over my word to accomplish it. Now why does an almond rod mean that? Okay, so a lot of people assume that maybe we're dealing with what he's seeing is kind of a, a, an image of Aaron's rod. Uh, if you remember when they placed their rods before Moses and Aaron's rod budded, what did it bud? Almond blossom. Okay, there's also a lot of significance in the building of the uh, temple where there were impressions of almond blossoms on things. And so there is, you know, the almond blossoms have been a part of God's word, God's representation to the people for several different times through the Old Testament. And so, you know, that God takes this idea of an almond tree branch or a rod, uh, that means I watch over my word to accomplish it. So, you know, maybe it's that sense of God watched over Aaron and providing proof that Aaron was to be the high priest in that case. Uh, so he did that by showing the almond branch, or the nature of his rod being from an almond tree. Um, would, would Jeremiah have been familiar with that, being a priest, and coming from a priestly family? Absolutely. I mean, that, that uh, especially if there's representations of almond in some of the things that he does, and so now we don't know exactly what his job was as a priest, and those jobs varied. Uh, but again, you can make some of the associations there. Then you've got this pot. You know, I see a boiling pot. Its lip tilted from the north to the south. And what does that mean? Yeah, disasters coming from the north. And so that idea of boiling water coming from the north toward the south, uh, boiling water being destruction, being, you know, that, that picture there, uh, God gives him the meaning of that image, the meaning of that uh, uh, happening in his head, however that works. Uh, that, that, that's what we have going on here. Chapter 2 and 3 gets into some of those condemning statements about the people. Uh, particularly, Israel is described as being a cheating bride. Okay? 
Have we seen that image before? Or that parallel made before? Quite a bit, haven't we? Jeremiah spends a lot of time talking about the infidelity of Israel and the fact that she has not been faithful to her God, that she has not been faithful to her husband. And particularly in Jeremiah, in this early section, it is laid out as clearly as you can be. That's one, another thing Tiffany and I talked about on the way over here is she loves the book of Jeremiah because it is so direct. Like there, there's very little question. Isaiah, you have a lot of times where you're going, well, is he talking about something immediate or something in the future or something in the far future? And you've got all of these different interpretations. People don't really struggle interpreting Jeremiah. Like, it's about as direct as it gets. You, you don't wonder what he's talking about. Uh, and that's the case here with this description of Israel, particularly when you get to the beginning of chapter 3, uh, where, it, you know, if a man divorces his wife, and she leaves him to marry another. Can he ever return to her? Well, Deuteronomy makes it clear that he cannot. Uh, would such a land become totally defiled? But you, you have prostituted yourself with many partners. Can you return to me? This is the Lord's declaration. You skip down to verse 8, and it makes this point. I observed that it was because unfaithful Israel had committed adultery that I had sent her away and had given her a certificate of divorce. Nevertheless, her treacherous sister Judah was not afraid, but also went and prostituted herself. And so he's using the example of, I've already brought destruction to Israel. Like, divorce has happened. We are done. That relationship is over. And that, that's the way I described it here with Israel. And then Judah went and did the same thing after seeing what happened with Israel. Uh, it, it's ridiculous that Judah wouldn't learn from what had already happened, but they didn't. Uh, and so God uses very clear, uh, a, a very clear illustration here to describe exactly the way his relationship has gone with this people. They have prostituted themselves over and over and over again. I find it interesting. You go back to what we studied about Hosea. It is interesting with Hosea. God commissioned him to go and do what? Marry a woman of harlotry. Whether she was before he married her or that happened after he married her, we get into debates about that. But he knew when he married this woman, that was going to be their future. And so he marries this woman. She commits adultery. Uh, it seems that she even, uh, based on the language there, gives herself to prostitution, and he must go and purchase her back as, uh, you know, purchase her away from her handler as a prostitute. But it's interesting that when he does that, it says, you will no longer know any man including me. That's what Hosea tells us. So are they restored back to, a, to, a, to an undefiled relationship when he purchases her back from her handler? No. And that's kind of what you have going on with, with this. God declares his relationship with Israel over. And then he goes on to say, Judah should have learned from that. But they didn't. Uh, and so that's why you've got some very uh, blunt, and difficult statements here about Judah and the things that she has done in rejecting and rebelling against her, her, her God. Uh, and so he reveals judgment that's going to come from the north and spends quite a bit of time talking about that, that this judgment, this boiling pot that's going to be poured out from the north, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uh, violent and, and awful and something really horrible to endure, uh, they are unfaithful, they are treacherous, um, they are, you know, Judah deserves all of these bad things that are to happen. Now, in doing that, what you find in chapter 4, you've got some reminiscent language here going back to the concept of the blessings and the curse. Now, what did God promise back in Deuteronomy? If they were faithful, how would God treat them? Good. He would handle them with love and care and compassion, and he would provide for them. He would be a good husband 
to them. He doesn't use that language as much in Deuteronomy, but you kind of relate all of that here in, in Jeremiah. What if they weren't faithful to the covenant? Curses. And bad curses. And he made it very clear exactly what they could expect if they decided to walk away from him. And have the people at this point walked away from him? Yes. And so Jeremiah makes it very clear. This is the agreement you were in. This is what you should expect. This is exactly the way all of this uh, was planned to happen. Okay, if you return, Israel, this is the Lord's declaration, you will return to me. If you remove your abhorrent idols from my presence and do not waver, then you can swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and in righteousness, then the nation will be blessed by him and will pride themselves in him. For this is what the Lord says to the men of Judah in Jerusalem. Break up the unplowed ground. Do not sow among the thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord Remove the foreskin of your heart, men of Judah and residents of Jerusalem, otherwise my wrath will break out like fire and burn with no one to extinguish it because of your evil deeds. What ends up happening? Repentance or destruction? Destruction. Because these people are unwilling to turn back to God. They are unwilling to follow him and do things his way. Uh, and that, you know, they deserve what's coming. Now, Jeremiah laments about it in the latter half of chapter 4. Uh, he does not like it. This is not news he, he is excited to deliver. Uh, he is not like you know, Jonah with Assyria. He's, he's not thrilled about this, but it's what's happening. It's what, what they should expect. The latter half of chapter 5 spends a lot of time talking about uh, the, the coming judgment and what they should expect as people who have rejected the Lord. Uh, the seas of Jerusalem is described in chapter 6. Uh, again, they have the opinion that as long as they have the temple, as long as they have the ark, can Jerusalem fall? They don't think so. But what is Jeremiah promising them? It's absolutely what's going to happen. Now, is Jeremiah popular with this message? No. No. One of the reasons he's not popular with this message is that there are plenty of other prophets, prophets, who are telling them, no, Jeremiah's wrong. He's just one of those negative Nellies. He's always looking for doom and gloom. He, he's just telling you things that, that are just going to upset you. Don't pay attention to Jeremiah. God will surely preserve his people because we are people. But that's not the case. Uh, and God, as we have seen, has sent messenger after messenger after messenger to warn the people. Unfortunately, they also have a slew of other messengers who are lying to them and telling them what they want to hear. So he does reveal in chapters 7 through 10 that they are going to be taken in exile to Babylon, uh, that that's what they can expect, that this is, this is, this is the coming judgment. So it's not just the destruction of Jerusalem, but it's the destruction of the people. That they are going to be taken in exile, they are, they are going to no longer be a people. Okay, And like Isaiah talked about the chopping down of the tree and the burning of the stump, that's essentially what Jeremiah is describing here in less poetic, more direct, and condemning language. Okay, uh, th this, is, this is what you need to expect. This is not just a famine that's going to be over in six months. This is not just some locusts that are going to come in and wipe out the crop. This is day of the Lord, final judgment, where God is going to not just cause difficulty for you, he is going to tear apart a city, he is going to destroy the temple. He is going to take his people and into exile and get rid of them completely. That's what we're dealing with here. And, uh, and it is about as negative and difficult to hear as you would imagine if you were one of those people. Scott? Mm 
Well, and not only did they not listen, they tried to shut him up over and over and over again. So it's not just, oh, well, just ignore Jeremiah. He's, he's, you know, we'll just, just don't give him an audience with the, in the, in the throne room anymore. It's beat him, throw him in the stocks, imprison him. Right? That, that, it, 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 it's even worse <clears throat> for him. Uh, and, and again, I also find it interesting that he begins this message when? As a young man, and who's on the throne? Josiah, when things were good. And he's giving them warning. I can understand. No, no, Jeremiah, we're, we're doing good. I mean, we're keeping the feast again. We read the law. We're actually going and making sacrifices. We're doing the things we're supposed to be doing. It probably was, was pretty easy to ignore when things were good. But then Jehoiakim becomes president or president, becomes king. And sometimes that's the same these days. And then uh, becomes king. And uh, and when that happens, you would have thought some of the people would have gone, Oh yeah, I, I see what he's saying now. Like we haven't kept the feast in several years. We're not doing the things we're supposed to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I do look out my window and see an idol uh, down the street in the center of the courtyard that people are bowing down to and leaving gifts for. Like, you would have thought once they saw the things that Jeremiah was saying actually happening, maybe they would have went, oh, maybe Jeremiah's not so off his rocker as we thought he was. Right? But do they? No. They don't listen. Janet? Yeah. I, I kind of wonder if it's not a bit the way I understand Samson. You know, Samson had three parts of his vow, right? And as long as he kept his vow, God would bless him with strength and all of those kind of things. Well, he had already broken the not touching dead stuff. He had already broken the, the, the partying, drinking, touching wine stuff. So, you know, we, we always sit there and go, what an idiot to tell the woman to cut his hair. But he had already broken every other part of his vow and still had his strength. So maybe it was, well, you know, God's still going to give me strength anyway. Um, maybe. I, I, I don't know. But it's one of those, when you see God still blessing you, even though you know you're in sin, and, well, God hadn't rejected us yet, so what else can we get away with? Yeah, maybe, maybe that's the kind of thing going on here. But, I mean, Janet's right. God promised from the blessings and curses, from the law, if you do not follow me, the land will spit you out. It, it won't be yours. but it had been theirs while they had been worshiping idols for how long? At least all these people's lifetime and their grandparents' lifetimes and their great-great-great-great-grandparents' lifetime. God, God had kept them in the land that long. But then again, I also wonder, they watched what happened with Israel. Shouldn't that have been a wake-up call? God felt like it should have been, but it wasn't. You, we forget sometimes just how stubbornly we can hold on to our sin. Yeah, I, I have been amazed over the years to watch people fiddle in their seats, uncomfortable when certain topics are talked about, but unwilling to confess or deal with their sins because they've gotten away with it this long. I, I, or watch people for months sit there and shift in their seat uncomfortably when the invitation is given because they know they need to do something, but they're unwilling to do it. I've watched it. And, and you, we sit there and go, well, why don't they just respond? Because we are stubborn with our sin. We're stubborn about it. And these people are no different. These people are a microcosm of human nature. 
Uh, and and there's, it does us good to pay attention to that. So Judah has broken her covenant with God. Several things are said about that in these chapters. The people are conspiring against Jeremiah. So now we're starting to see some pushback on Jeremiah and the things that he's saying, representing. Jeremiah prays for God's judgment on the people. Uh, you know, he recognizes this all needs to take place. Um, I, honestly, I, I kind of wonder if it's, let's, let's get this over <laughs> like, <laughs> with all that he was dealing with. Uh, God answers, basically, I guarantee I'm going to take care of this. Uh, th this. Don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of it. Uh, and God has Jeremiah buy a, a girdle and go out and kind of bury it and then let it get decrepit and then pull it back out. And that idea of, of the restrictions, that the people are no longer restricting themselves from sin the way a girdle would be useful for me to hold some of this belly in. Uh, you know, that it, he, uh, he, he uses an object lesson with Jeremiah, basically. And uh, so then there's a drought and a prayer for mercy regarding the drought. Again, how many times in the minor prophets that we've studied so far have we learned that God sent warning after warning after warning after warning well, a little drought here, a locust here, this problem here, this problem here. Try to wake the people up so that they would confront their sin, but they refuse to wake up. As soon as things get better, nobody needs God anymore. Uh, and Or maybe things get better and we're going to give credit to this false God instead of the one true God. Or, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why. So the, fa the false prophet lying, I'm just kind of speeding through so I can get done with the... Uh, the through chapter 20. The false prophets are lying about the coming judgment. Jeremiah's out there preaching judgment is, is impending. It, it's going to happen. It's, 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 a, it's around the corner, and the false prophets are going, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just, he's just exaggerating. He's just trying to make things difficult for everyone. Oh, he's just one of those goody two-shoes who's concerned about things going his way, you know. There's all sorts of different ways that people uh, reject the messenger when they can't reject the message, right? And isn't that the way it normally goes? I don't like what you have to say, so I'll discredit you. We see this a lot in politics, don't we? Let's discredit the person because I can't really discredit what they say. And then if nobody's listening to the person anymore, then we don't have to listen to what they say. And, and that's what happens with Jeremiah. Uh, they discredit him. So chapter 16, verses, God gives some hope. Turn with me there. I'd much rather look at the hopeful passages than the, than the impending doom passages. But uh, chapter 16, starting in verse 14. However, look, the days are coming, the Lord's declaration, when it will no longer be said, as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites from the land of Egypt, but rather... As the Lord lives who brought the Israelites from the land of the north and from the other land where he had banished them, for I will return them to the land that I gave to their ancestors. And so again, you'll no longer be known as the people who were rescued from Egypt. You will soon be known as the people who were rescued from the north. Right? And, and that again is, is, is that glimmer of hope that there still is something that's going to last even after this destruction. And so they're told they should trust in God instead of their own hearts. Uh, chapter 17 has several famous verses in it about the heart being deceitful and those types of things. Don't trust your own heart. Don't trust the own way of thinking about things. Trust God. God's the one with the answers. God's the one who gives hope. God is the one uh, who will help you. Uh, they're told they need to keep the Sabbath because they're not keeping the Sabbath the way that they should. Real quick, finish up. We've got some statements about the potter and the clay. Fantastic passage of Scripture about the, the role of God versus the role of man and the fact that we need to recognize God is the one who's really in control, not us. We do not chart our path. God charts our path. God controls our future. Uh, and we need to recognize that. Uh, the broken jar... Uh, idea here of the that that's kind of how the people will be destroyed they will be demolished and not be able to put back together uh, without God doing it and then Jeremiah is told to be persecuted and he prays his complaint 
We'll come back and talk a little bit about chapter 20 on Wednesday night as we introduce the next section. But go ahead and read the next section, which is long, Jeremiah 21 through 39. A long reading, but we've got to get through it. So Jeremiah 21 through 39. 